This week on our podcast, we're having a conversation with Senator Greg Hembree, chairman of the Senate Education Committee. We're excited to talk to him about leadership, education, and the value of school choice. Welcome to the Institute Leaders Lifeline. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Institute Leaders Lifeline. My name is Mike Sinclair. I'm Deputy Superintendent of School Support at the Charter Institute at Erskine. And I'm so glad you've joined us for this episode. You're going to hear a fantastic interview with Senator Greg Hembry. He's the chairman of the Senate Education Committee. But first, let me give you a couple of reminders here. Really two big dates, and I want them to stand out in your mind if you're a leader at the Institute. Leaders meeting will be in person on February the 9th. That will be in Columbia. We talked about it a little bit in our leaders meeting on January the 11th, so hopefully you've got that fresh in your mind, but go ahead and register for our meeting February 9th here in Columbia. That will be the February leaders meeting. Then we have at the end of January, so let's backtrack a week or so, on January 25th will be the school choice rally. The school choice rally here in Columbia. All of those details are on our leaders page. So if you don't have those, shoot me an email and I'll make sure that you get them if you are one of our charter schools. Finally, not a date, just some reminders here. January is School Board Appreciation Month. So if you're a charter leader or if you're a board member, we thank you for being a board member. And if you're a leader, thank your board members for their service. They have often a very silent role as far as the public's concerned, but they play a huge role in our school's success. Now, I want to preview just a quick thought from today's uh, interview that you're going to listen to with Senator Hembry. He really stresses in a lot of different ways, and I'm going to summarize it here. We have to look at all of our options in education. Every model, every platform, all of the ways that we can touch and improve on our students. We have a huge gap to overcome. We know that through COVID, through lots of different variations that were happening around that time, and we can't just put all our eggs in one basket. This is about kids. This isn't about our personal gain. This isn't about a political platform. This isn't about protecting the fiefdom that we live in. This is about kids. We have to look at options and do what's best for our students. And that's what you're going to hear today in this episode. And stick around to the end. It tells a little funny story about the Senate. It gave me a chance to see they're just people like you and I. They don't lock themselves away when they're not in session. So watch and listen to the entire podcast. I know you're going to enjoy what Senator Hembree has to say. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Institute Leaders Lifeline. I am joined by a great friend of ours in the Senate, the South Carolina Senate, Senator Hembree. He's chairman of the Education uh, Committee in the Senate. And we really thank you for giving your time. I know this is a really crazy time as you're ramping up the new session. Yeah, it's, it's already busy. <laughs> yeah, you started good way to be with you. Yeah. Good. Well, thanks for joining us. We're also with our good friend, Superintendent Cameron Runyon, who's joined us for a couple of interviews. So looking forward to just having a good dialogue and just kind of letting you meet Senator Hembree. Um, and find out some more stuff about him as well as some things that we could look for coming up in the Senate Education Committee. So let's kick it off. We talk as school leaders about raising leaders for the next generation. I mean, we, we've got to be looking at it. There is a vacuum of leadership right now. So tell me a little bit about how did you become a leader? What are some of your influences that got you to this position? Well, you know, it's like most people, I think. Uh, I had uh, a father who was a leader in his own, in his profession. And um uh, he was an example to me. Um, my mother was a leader in her profession, and so that I had a, a you know st strong example at home. Um, I had some teachers along the way, as you know, junior high and high school teachers that were um, certainly one that inspired me to be a lawyer. Um, another that was a uh, sh she was a history and civics teacher who um, was just that kind of, a was that teacher, that inspirational teacher that if you're lucky, you know, you get that. And we've all had at least one, you know, you usually meant several, but she was that, she was that teacher uh, and probably led me to my interest in government, um, you know, and, and how things work and the constitution and then, the, you know, the, the separation of powers and, and, uh, and all, all those things I learned from her. So, um, uh, well, I mean, my parents, you know, supported that, but that she was the one that I, I kind of got got it when I was going along. And quite frankly, um, got involved in leadership in my Methodist Youth Fellowship group as a junior high student. And, you know, you think, well, it's just something to do, you know, and you're, you know, but, but it was the first time I got elected to anything <laughs> and I started doing the work and I thought, well, that's, I, I kind of like that. And literally, you know, student council on up and 
president of the student body and, uh, you know, kind of uh, president of my fraternity. You know, he just sort of was this progression. Uh, the president of the fraternity, uh, that was about the point when I decided I didn't want to be a leader. And, uh, but I got through it. It was, it was uh, I'm not doing it again. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, if, if, I'm, you know, if I'm nominated, I will not accept. And if I'm elected, I will not serve. So not for a second term on that one. But, um, you know, didn't really plan. I you know, didn't, did not plan to go into um, it wasn't my plan to go to the South Carolina Senate that, you know, this, these things are more organic than they were, you know, like I'm going to do this and this and this, it was, it just sort of came to be. And, um, uh, quite frankly, the, um, I did want to be a prosecutor. And, and then I realized I would like to lead a prosecutor's office. And I got to do that uh, for 25, well, the lead the office for 14 years. Uh, that was my profession. You know, that's what I spent my, my adult life doing. And then this position in the Senate came up and, and, um, well, it was time for me to leave the solicitor's office. You know, you kind of knew I was getting worn out. It's a high pressure job. And um, I thought, well, you know, why not try the Senate? And so here I am. That's awesome. That's, That's awesome. a long story. You know, well, what's, what's great is we, we, see, we see parents and we, you know, that's a strong piece of what we need in our culture and society now, but then education, just the, just the role teachers play. And they don't realize it sometimes. So it's great to see how that played well, out. Well, in my church, you know, in that, and the you know, church, and even right. in, the, in a leadership way, that, that folded into it to, to kind of, you know, sort of foundational building blocks. That's great. That's great. Well, <clears throat> Senator, I, as I recall, you're a bit of a baseball fan. Uh, and, um, you know, in South Carolina, it seems like in the past few years, when it comes to empowering parents, uh, to make choices for their children's education, and we got a pretty good batting average. Uh, I think the, the General Assembly, y'all have just been terrific uh, leading and opening up uh, avenues for your constituents and families writ large uh, across the state of South Carolina. So as, as you look at the landscape now, we have a, a new, you're, you're, the, you're the senior statesman now uh, in education in South Carolina. You have a new uh, chairman in the House, uh, Shannon uh, Erickson, who's going to be there. We're very excited about her. Recently interviewed her as yeah, well. Yeah, she'll be terrific. She'll be terrific. Um, uh, Ellen Weaver, our, our dear friend, close friend, uh, Ellen Weaver, we're very excited about her. And she obviously has a, a very visible commitment to school choice and has for a long, long time, as does Chairman Erickson. And then, of course, Governor McMaster. Uh, has been very open about his support of school choice as well and furthering options for parents and students across the state. So as, as chairman of, of education, you're looking around now, I would assume, at a landscape where, where sort of all the, all the pieces are in place, where all your colleagues that have an impact on this, that it seems that there's general alignment uh, there. So I would just, what is your, sort of your hopes uh, for the next few years uh, in, in the school choice realm, be that in public school choice or, or even beyond that, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a, a, a sign over my, in my, you've been in my office, and uh, when you leave the, the Senate Education Committee office, there's a sign over the door that says students first. And uh, I've been up there, I've been chairman for four years, that sign's been there for four years. And I really do, you know, I really look at this issue of educating our kids from the vantage point of the students first. Um, the, the, um, you know, the, the principals, the school boards, the administrators, um, every, every other sort of group in the K-12 system has lobbyists over there every single day looking out for their interests, okay, and advocating for their interests. And that's appropriate. I'm not knocking that at all. That's fine. But there's, there, there's really one group that does not have that advocate. And um, I mean, these are these are highly intelligent uh, um, you know, advocates in the lobby. They're getting paid a lot of money to fight the good fight for whatever they're fighting it for, whatever subgroup. But there's the, the, the kids, the students and the parents don't have anybody over there for them. So, and I, you know, even just take it to the students themselves, because sometimes the parents are the problem. I mean, that, you know, it is. I, I came with a background in criminal justice, yeah. and I saw it over and over again that there was, you know, you, you could figure out why this kid's in juvenile court when you met mama or daddy. And you realize, well, this is, you know, this, this kid doesn't have a chance because it's, it's sorry parents they've got. That happens. Um, but, but so, I, you know, my, my so it, that folds back into the choice. I think that um, it's not, a, you know, kid, ch students are different. Children are different. They're, they're, their family situations are very different. So I think it's the only way to, to maximize and to reach the full, that child to reach their full potential is to find the right choice that fits. You know, the traditional public school is going to be the right choice for most kids. I mean, that's going to be the best choice. I'm not going to say it's perfect, but it's going to be the best choice. But but there are other options out there that 
many times are a better choice for that child. You know, virtual education. And, and we, we went, you know, we, we experimented with our, this pandemic forced us into this situation where we had to have this broad based virtual program. It was a it was a catastrophe. I mean, and even those that were defending it back when it was you know, being deployed and they were caught, you know, critical of me because you could see what was happening. Um, and I was ta- saying it um, now are saying, you know, that was a failure. I mean, the most biggest supporter back then was saying will now acknowledge that that program on a large scale was a failure. But there were students that did it. You know, they, they were forced to do it, and it suited them. Right. And now they're in virtual charter schools um, or other programs, but mostly it's charter schools, and they're thriving in that environment. So you know, you can't just assume you know that everybody's the same. And 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 so uh, if you want to, if you want every child to reach their potential, and we all say we want to do that, then as a legislature, we have to expand that, those choices and keep looking for different ones. Um, you know, I think the, the education pod idea is one that's, you know, not really, I don't know that it's taken off in South Carolina, but it's, you know, it's a, it's sort of a variant on the homeschool. I mean, right. there's going, there are going to be students. That's going to be a good, a good model for, um, um, you know, well, there's, I mean, so we just have to, we have to be willing <clears throat> to, you know, we don't have to defend the status quo so desperately. It's not K-12 education, public traditional K-12 education is not going to collapse. It's not going to crash and burn. And these these stories that, the, you know, sometimes the, the, the status quo crowd presents, uh, these narratives are, are, they're overblown and they're not accurate and they're, and they're scare people and, um, and they're, they just aren't, they're not wise. And, it's, and they're not looking out for the student first. They're looking out for a system. Okay, it's not our role to protect a system. It's our role to look out for that student. So, um, can you know, I say amen right there? Amen, brother. Yeah, it was a bit of a, it was sermon number 27. It did sound that way, but it, you know, I feel strongly about it. And, and uh, um, you know, we have, of course, we have education and uh, uh, scholarship accounts that we're going to be debating coming right up. It, it will be, we're hoping to have it the, the very first bill that we debate in South Carolina. And so uh, it will provide an, a, a pathway for students that otherwise could not go to private school to give them an opportunity to, to try that as an option. And it's not picking winners and losers, it's giving choice to, uh, to our, our, our students and, our, and, our, and their families. So just one more um, opportunity option that we're gonna look at. It's a big deal. I mean, we've been talking about it in South Carolina for 25 years. Uh, we were within a cat's whisker of passing it last year and hopefully we'll be able to, to push that through this year and, and have that add that to the choice stack. But, you know, I don't quite frankly, Cameron, looking forward, um, you know, I don't know that I have any new other models, you know, that I'm looking at right now. Uh, other, uh, uh, man, I, there's only so many ways you can do it, I guess, but, um, but I think we, we always have to be open-minded. And I think uh, as the people that set education policy, be prepared to go, yeah, it's a little risky, but why don't we give it a try? You know, it might help. It's not going to help. It might not help 50% of our students, but if it helps 2%, that's 2%. It's a game of inches, you know, so. That's true. Well, and, I, and I love what you said. So I, as you know, I have my own children are in a virtual mm-hmm. uh, learning environment. I and uh, uh, my, I have three that are old enough for school. One is still is not there yet. Um, and it's been you know, it was a challenge making the, the switch to virtual, but in our situation, they have a mother that's at home uh, that can be there, that can can mentor them and lead them and tutor them. And it's just been phenomenally successful for them. And they've just flourished. And what it has really taught me firsthand as a, as a, both a parent and as a superintendent is, is reinforce exactly what you just said, which is that one mode of education is not necessarily right for two different students. Even within the same family. Correct. I mean, you know, so it's, it's you got that. And, and I, I'll just add one more thing that I always, um, I don't want to leave this out. I don't want to forget it. You know, when you talk about education choice, and, and sometimes there are teachers that are in the traditional K-12 system that, you know, they just get really upset about, you know, even suggesting that something other than their particular model is is maybe uh, successful for a student. Um, I have to always say to them, and I think this is important to, to note, this is choice for them too. This is choice for teachers. When you have different opportunities to provide learning in a different model, many of the teachers are, are you know, they're not, they're not upset about the pay. They're not. They're upset about the bureaucracy that they're having to work in. That's what's really driving them out of the profession. And if they can find another model to teach in, some of them just thrive. You know, where otherwise they were kind of getting burned out and bumping along and not really finding fulfillment. Uh, this is an. Uh, this is not just 
school choice for kids, it's school choice for teachers. And um, and I think that's, I mean, I think it's something that kind of gets missed in the conversation because we get so focused on defending uh, uh, or, you know, kind of taking our positions. But I think I think it's it's great for educators too. That's right. a smart point. And leaders. And leaders. Absolutely. Absolutely. Speaking of bureaucracy, I think that's one thing is navigating all of the requirements out there. Are there, is there any talk from your end or any thoughts on any way that we can evaluate some of that bureaucracy? What's an effective way that we can encourage our leaders who we hear from that we can partner together to maybe help you or help Representative Erickson or, or Superintendent Weaver see those things? The, um, the General Assembly, it was my bill, matter of fact, but about five, four, four or five years ago, uh, we passed a, a bill that required the Department of Education to do an analysis of the bureaucracy in the system. And you really have to do it literally from a schoolroom all the way to the right. top. And, and I, we can't go, I mean, D.C. is a different problem, but at least the top of South Carolina. And, and that's where most of the, you know, most of the action is. Um, and we got, you know, we, they, they did it and we got a study back, got a report back. And like a lot of the, you know, the things we do in Columbia, and I'm just as guilty, you know, you get the report. And I mean, I read through it, but, you know, it's, you put it on the shelf and it starts getting dust. And then, you know, you haven't really taken any action to address the the the, the challenge. Um, there is a renewed interest in that. I, um, I'm, I'm, I think it's a terrific idea. I'm a great supporter of that concept. I know that the new superintendent is very interested in that. I know that uh, Representative Erickson is very interested in that. We've all talked about it. Uh, governor's offices, we're all, we're all singing this off the same sheet of music. The, the challenge, though, is the work is not pretty and it's not easy because you literally have to get way down into the weeds. It takes somebody time, effort, and energy to find out, you know, that form that we fill out that we were doing from 1972, you know, we're collecting all that data on the computer over here now. We don't need to fill out. I mean, there are things like that. We, you know, I, I know it. Um, and, and I perceive, I don't know, I know there are a few things, but my perception is there are probably quite a few things that we could either condense, uh, use technology to streamline or, you know, or lim you know, eliminate them altogether. Just they're, they're obsolete. So um, I'm hopeful that, but the, that sort of an analysis, you know, sort of paper flow analysis has to be done by the, uh, I think by the department okay. and the districts themselves. Um, I mean, I, I don't think you can send, you know, the department can't send a team to every single classroom, yeah. just not workable. Uh, but they can manage the program through the districts, give them some, because you're going to see patterns. You right. know, you're going to see things that are, it's what they're doing in Florence One is similar to what they're doing in Horry County. You know, we saw this problem over in Florence One, you're doing the same thing. And, you know, so... Y'all might want to compare notes. I mean, I think right. they're the clearinghouse for that effort and the coordinator of that effort. But it really will have to be a district-wide kind of thing. Right. Um, and, you know, uh, one of the things that we've, and this just goes back to something we've done as a society. I saw it in law. You see it in medicine. You see, you see it any any place. You know, we, we over time, you add processes. Right. We do a whole lot of process for very little improvement in value. Okay. Um, and and I, I mean, I can... Just to give an example, when I started as a you know a young prosecutor, my file for a bur you know, burglary case would be about that thick. By the time I finished, um, you know, 25 years later, my file for a routine burglary case was now this thick. Right. There wasn't that much more in there. I mean, a lot of paper and a lot of process, not a lot more value. Um, so I, you know, and that's just human nature. And it's, but but you know, there's no reason why we can't tackle that and get rid of some of this stuff that just. We don't need it anymore. Right. So yeah, we're, we're on. Well, most of it's with good intention. You know, that's why right, we, we, right. we hire a new position to make life better. And that person tries to make life better and they create processes. Right, right, right. It's don't it, eliminate the old ones. We that's just keep adding the, that's the problem. Ones. You know, even uh, we even talked about um, uh, in, in meetings with the superintendent and uh, representative Erickson about and I kind of put put it back on the department. I said, tell us in Title 59, the code that, that right. covers education, uh, tell us in Title 59 what we need to, you know, we, we you, I know there's a bunch of archaic, unnecessary statutes in there that are just, right. I know it. I, I, we, we've eliminated a few of them on, on some work I've done on. So, um, uh, you know, but that needs to be a more systematic analysis. And quite frankly, I don't have the knowledge base. And sometimes I can look at a statute and go, it sounds kind of, I wonder if we still do that, but I don't know. I don't, I'm not in the, you know, I don't manage schools as a, that's not my job. So um, I need somebody to tell me, yeah, Senator, we really could get rid of this. And, right. and we, I'd love to start cleaning out the drawers like that. That's great to hear. That's great to hear. I'm going to borrow that is that does the process 
add value because it is tempting to, to you could just create processes all day long, but they don't need more people. They need more to manage people. the process. The process. They didn't add yeah. any value in the first yes. place. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I love that. That's wise. That's wise. Um, so, Senator, you know, we've been at this now at the Charter Institute at Erskine for five years of operation, and we had a year zero. So we're at six years total that we're in to right now. And um, you were around when when we came onto the scene. And and you remember that there was there was a season of of, of turmoil. The, the waters were churned up yeah. uh, a little bit. And, and in the past few years, of course, with uh, Superintendent Neely coming to the public charter school district, and we've seen the collaboration between these two districts reach what some have said is is a historic uh, level of cooperation and collaboration between two you know, competing, uh, if you will, uh, school districts. Um, can you speak from, you know, from your vantage point, from where you sit on how that relationship, that collaboration, that, that co-laboring uh, mentality between the public charter school district and ERSC and how that's impacted uh, school choice and the charter sector and, and beyond, uh, in your opinion? Well, you know, there's, there's a couple of ways to approach that. One, you've got a group out there. There are people out there that are going to be against public charter schools. I mean, it's not a huge number of people. They're vocal. They can be loud. Uh, and so they're looking for opportunities, as you know, to, to try to yank the rug out from under the charter school movement and that the public charter school movement. And I talk to people all the time that still somehow think this is a private school. It's the darndest thing. It's just, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of misunderstanding out there and mischaracterization, quite frankly, sometimes in that conversation. But um, so when you got, you know, you got some people that are sort of trying to, you know, trying to knock you over the head anyway, um, to be at odds with one another uh, is just, it's not good for the, for the, it's not good for the students, right? It's not good for the, the system. It's not good for the effort. It's not good for the students. So, um, you know, when, when Erskine started, and quite frankly, I was a little, I was, uh, you may remember, I was a, a little skeptical. You know, you just don't know how an experiment's going to work out. And at the beginning, it's an experiment. And uh, and it's been a it's been a tremendous success. You've heard me say this a bunch of times. You know, it's one of those that you go, hmm, I hope it's going to work out, and then it does, and then it really exceeds your expectations. You're just like, wow, this is a great experiment. Right. It really turned out. Uh, and I think, honest to goodness, I think the reason, one of the fundamental reasons that it did work out so well, was because y'all, you know, you and Chris. Neely, y'all got together at a point. I don't know exactly when the magic happened. It was right when you started. It was pretty soon after you started. It, it was pretty quick. Yeah, we sat down and had lunch when he had been offered the job. We went to lunch and you know, laid out uh, some some ground rules for how we thought that these two districts could come to, together as one. Yeah. Well, that was the magic lunch. Yeah. yeah so I'll, <laughs> if I, send me the bill. I'll pay for it. It was uh, it was worth it. No, it was. Uh, but when you know, and y'all have stuck to that. You know, you haven't. Um, and and I'm sure there are disagreements that have come up between the two of you, but I don't know about them. And, and I, they're not talking about them on the street. You know, that's not, oh, the charter schools are in disarray. No, it looks like y'all have your stuff together. And when you you guys are you know presenting together at budget meetings or at other meetings, uh, Senate Education Committee meetings, um, it's impressive. I mean, it makes it makes for, um, uh, I don't want to say, well, I, have an old, I have a saying that, you know, legislators don't want justice, they want quiet. Um, but that's not really, it's not really true like that. But there is a lot of, uh, when they see a lot of trouble and noise and smoke, they, you know, they feel like they got to run to it and do something. And um, oftentimes that leads to unintended consequences. So I think that cooperation and, I don't, you know, I think it's, it's been a, a critical thing, and you know, limestone now is coming on coming online. And I've, you know, you and I've talked about that numerous times. I've talked to the leadership at Limestone, in no uncertain terms, I'm like, y'all need to quiet, you know, y'all need to work all three of you together um, if you want this experiment to be successful. That's the one piece of advice I would give you. So, and that'll take time. I mean, you don't do that overnight. You know, you got to build relationships, and they're such an early stage. But um, yeah, it's been a, it's been a, a lot of fun to to watch and be a, a little bit of a part of, you know, so you do, y'all doing the heavy lifting. Well, that was a great encouragement. Thank you. For yeah, that. Well, it is. It's true. All right. I'm going to go back and I'm going to ask you a personal question here, okay. a little softball question, but it's important to our leaders. One thing that we've talked throughout this podcast is as a leader, you have to embrace all the roles. You can't pick and choose. Like you, you're, you got a family, you got a career, you got all these different things. And, and I know you, you have a great career. Your leadership in the Senate is very diverse in your roles there, but, but you also have grandkids and you got a family, you got all that to take care of. How do you juggle all that? Or what, what advice would you give to some of our younger leaders, our new leaders that are up and coming? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, uh, it, it, 
I've given this advice to people that were looking at going to the General Assembly. Um, make sure your family foundations are, are you know, that, your home is solid. That foundation, that's where you start. That's that's your firmest, you know, that's where you start here and then you go out like concentric circles. Okay. Um, and if, if that's not solid, and, and quite frankly, you know, I've told people that had young families that were thinking about running for General Assembly from our area, I've discouraged it. I'm like, you, you, the General Assembly will be there forever. You know, you can do that anytime, um, but you can't go to your son's first football game every time, and you're gonna miss a bunch of that right. stuff if you live where I live. You now, if you live in Columbia, that's a different situation. Um, but I, you know, I don't know. I think you just do the best you can. I, I, everybody's kind of. I don't know that I have any really profound wisdom <laughs> about um, how to balance your, you know, your um, your time with family and time with work and time, you know, time with the paying job and then time with this work. You know, this isn't, I mean, it pays, but not very much. Can't live on it. Right. Um, so uh, other than, you know, make sure you, I guess you have your priorities in order. And with me, you know, if my grandkids, I mean, I'll, this happens all the time. I'm in my, my, my home office downstairs in my house. I'm working on reading, you know, I'm preparing a summary for a bill or, you know, I'm talking to somebody about some issue, working on constituent issues. And my grandkids show up at, on, you know, three o'clock, in the afternoon on a Thursday, and I go, okay, I'll do this later. And I mean, I will, you know, it's, it's not, you know, I guess it's seldom is it, you know, the world's not gonna stop turning. You know, <laughs> okay. It really isn't. Right. And you're not the only one that can take care of this. You know, you really aren't. No, so um, uh, you feel like you are, but you're not. And so, uh, but your grandchildren are, you are the only grandfather they have, you know, so um, you can't, can't, can't replace it. It's that prioritization. Yeah, I think just, you know, and kind of knowing who you are. I mean, real basic stuff, kind of knowing what's important to you. But that's a lot. But knowing who you are, not not who you think others want you to be, who yeah, you right, are. Right. Yeah. I think that's, and it's hard. That's you know, it's not it's not as easy. Not as, it, it was easy and we'd all be we all be self, you know, self-aware and well-adjusted human beings. And we're all a little weird, you know, so, <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, Senator, you, you'll recall when. Um, when the Charter Institute was formed, that one of the emphasis points that we had was on rural education. Mm -hmm. uh, Erskine College, of course, we come out of Erskine College, is in Abbeville County. Uh, very long history in, in Abbeville mm -hmm. County and some of the challenges with rural education. And, and we've done some of that. And, you know, we, we founded Belton Preparatory Academy, which is the number one Title I school in the state of South Carolina for two years in a row now, and number two overall. Of I'm glad you worked that in. Yes. I mean, that's a good one to work in there. Yeah, that's, that's it's something uh, to be proud of. But it's, it's you know, it's important because I think what, what a school like Belton proves is that it's possible. Yeah. It's possible to do it. And it doesn't take a magnificent facility. Mm -hmm. They're doing it in portables and in a church. And it really comes down to leadership and culture and expectations for, for students and a process to get the students there. Um, but so that's been a heart of ours and, and it's been great to have some wins like that. But when you look at South Carolina, there, there's so much more that needs to happen for our rural communities. I grew up in a rural community in Hampton County and I think in 10 years, there were three of us out of that community that I'm aware of that went to Furman University because they just don't get that kind of opportunity by and large. Um, so as a policymaker, how do you think we begin to really reach into those struggling, uh, poor rural communities that have languished for so long and, and to provide that, that found educational foundation that so many of them desire because we just see parents lining up in droves whenever we go to open a school right. in those areas. But but it's a hard, it's difficult to open a school and run a school in a rural area as well. So I would, would love your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think you've got the right answer already. I, I mean, charters are, are part of the answer. I know they're, you know, with the ES, the education scholarship accounts, there's some um, parochial schools that are, that are, ex that are looking at um, building facilities in rural areas that they, they believe with this additional money that the families, in that area could 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 go to that kind of you know that school that have that school choice as an option um you know I, the, the the challenge in rural schools is is it's been around for a hundred years i mean this is not a new problem it's 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 a it's a universal it's a it's na national problem in these communities that um they don't have thriving economies they don't really have much going on and so it's just an impossible to recruit teachers there. I mean, that's the that's the uh, you know the hardest part. And we're working, uh, we've been working hard on that. We're going to continue to work hard on teacher recruitment retention in South Carolina. Quite frankly, I think the you know if there was a silver bullet, and there's not a silver bullet, but if I had to pick two things that if I could wave a magic wand and 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 say okay, the, if I could fix this in a day, I think it would have the greatest impact. It would be to have a system 
program method of preparing exceptional school leaders, particularly at the principal level. I think that's where the that's where the, really the rubber meets the road. Um, and, um, superintendents are important, but um, if you've got great principals, you can have a real average superintendent and it won't matter. The, the, the problem is you, if you have a real average superintendent, you're probably not going to have a bunch of great principals. That's the, the problem with that. And then likewise, um, the second thing would be the preparation of teachers and uh, uh, having, you know, having them prepared, better prepared to be working in a classroom. I've been talking about it like this. We need to prepare teachers more like we prepare doctors and not so much like we prepare lawyers. Um, you know, lawyers kind of go in the classroom and they sit and the, you get, get a lecture and you get, get asked questions by the teacher, the Socratic method kind of stuff. But you're not in a courtroom. You're not dealing with clients. You're not dealing with people. You don't have any idea what practicing law is about. I didn't know anything about practicing law. Thankfully, I had some, you know, charitable fellow lawyers that took me under their wing and, and helped me learn what being a lawyer was about. Um, same with doctors. They, I mean, they do some classroom stuff, but they're in, they're in with patients. They're in the clinics. They're working the job, and it's and so I really believe, and we do a lot of it, you know. And, and there are places that do more of it. I mean, so it's it's not that it's not being done now, but I think that's where we can really ramp up how we prepare our teachers to be truly ready to go into a classroom to deal with parents, to deal with children that are you know causing trouble or whatever they're you know uh, chaos in the classroom to, um, you know, how, the, how what is going to make me effective and how to be effective with that kid versus that kid. Um, those are things you can't learn. I mean, it's like being a lawyer. You can't, you don't, you try a case. These, these are nuances that you got to try cases. Nobody can tell you this. you got to try them and you'll figure it out. You'll learn it if you're paying attention at all. And then same thing, I think, with teaching. And I think, uh, you know, we're, we're, uh, and I think if it's part of that, I think that the, the rural initiative is, is where we can make that difference, at least in the traditional K-12 system. Let me go back to that. I think alternatives, we talked a little bit about that, are critical too, uh, and it's worked, and it can work in other places, but it's just a matter of where you can find a good fit. Um, but it, when you're looking more at the traditional system, I think the key to that is it's going to be grow your own. I mean, you're going to have to, that's, that's absolutely sort of the concept that we have to pursue and then how are we going to go about that and we're doing a lot there's a lot already going on and a lot of good things that are already going on there and success stories so it's not like it's a whole thing's a failure it's that you know you got a pocket here that's making it work and then you got these over here that can't seem to get out of their own way and they can't recruit because there's nothing there i mean well if i'm a smart young teacher from ori county why would i want to go to a place where there's you know there's nobody for me to date there's nobody for me to go out with there's no place to go you know except for the sonic you know and uh, go shop at the at the dollar store. I mean, you know, it's just not. I mean, it's not making fun of anybody. It's just we got a lot of communities that are struggling, and there's just right. nothing going on there. So it's tough. Right. Yeah, that, that's a great point. We do see that in charters often, particularly in our rural communities, mm -hmm. that it, it can be very difficult to bring the talent in, yep. and because charters have to perform, they have to have talent, or it doesn't work. Um, so what you see in some charters, particularly in our more rural areas, is that they even have to go so far as to rely on teachers from other countries I mean, to to bring them in. And that's such a Wrong headed. I mean, they just, need, they just need a warm body in there. Um, and I had a, a guy who was a principal tell me some years ago, and he's now um, uh, is dean of one of the colleges of education. But um, we were at this meeting, and he um, talked to me afterwards. He said, "We, I want you to help. I want to help you understand something about this." And he was in a rural district. He said, "I used to." He goes, "I was a principal in this rural this rural school," and he goes, "I just needed somebody with a pulse." I mean, I, I didn't have the luxury of this, you know, all this talent I could just right. bring in willy nilly. I just needed a warm body up there to prevent, you know, pandemonium. And um, and you know, I'm not saying it's good, it's bad, but I'm saying it's real. And, and you, when you're that principal, you're stuck with that. So, um, um, you know, that's us. We've got to, you know, that's the trick on figuring out more. Right. We got to build that talent pool and make it not only larger, um, but we need to make it better or better prepared. I don't want to be better. It makes sense. And excessive, right? Well, the governor had a, you know, that was in his uh, speech today. I mean, he was talking about, you know, making the teaching profession more attractive. <clears throat> well, he's, you know, he's, we, we've raised salaries now yeah, by, right. by um, thirty three percent in five years, wow. which is nobody's getting that, you know, nobody in, in, in state government or in government. Um, and then we're looking at where he's he's wanting to raise it another ten thousand dollars, and I think he's on the right track. I think this is part of the transformation of the profession. Um, things have changed. You know, it used to be, y'all know this, teachers were, you know, I mean, my, my teachers 
where, you know, their husband had the insurance. It was like leave it to Beaver days, you know. Their husband had the insurance agency, and she was, you know, she was, the wife was a teacher, and sort of, you know, it, they weren't relying just on her income. You know, maybe they're getting some benefits, and that was a good thing. But, you know, it wasn't, the, it was a secondary income in the family, and, um, and that's kind of what you had. And you could pay, so you could pay people less and get away with it. If, you know, as a government, you know, taxpayers could get away with paying teachers less because it was a different, you know, sort of societal structure now, you know, you got to put, these are, this is their primary income. I mean, you don't, you're, you know, a lot of times t teachers are married, you know, or, um, and they're, you know, they're both teachers, but you don't have, well, I'm, I don't really make this much, but it's okay because he makes that much. You know, it's, it's not, don't have that same model anymore. So we've got to, you know, we've got to, we're going to change the pay scale, but a lot of issues with that too. Okay, I'm, <laughs> that's a whole nother show. Well, personally, I, I hope that that is, is, Y'all continue that effort that you've made so much headway on that at some point we will we'll start to attract men into the classroom yeah. as well. And we, we need those positive male role models, particularly in some of these communities where candidly you just don't have the male presence in homes that we may have had 40 or 50 years ago. And yeah. so to have that these men in the classroom to, to model what it means to be a responsible man in society and, and to contribute to the society is just desperately needed, in my opinion. Uh, I know. And there's some good efforts, you know, some good efforts, as y'all know, going on in South Carolina, but they're small. I mean, they're kind of small and, and they're localized. You know, some districts have their own. Uh, Charleston has their own program that is you know geared toward getting men in the classroom. Uh, and you got you know the call me Mister program is sort of the one everybody you know, the flagship everybody knows about that and it's a it's a very successful program so um, I think you know, there's a, there's it's like I say there's not that there aren't success stories out there it just aren't and you know we need more and we right. just got to keep building All right on a daily annual session basis in the Senate I know y'all have some really heavy topics and we've talked about several here that are serious and a lot of people are going to be impacted by it um, especially our youth. But in the Senate, what is a funny story? What is something that you didn't see coming or you don't have to use any names. We don't want to incriminate anybody. But what's something that's happened that maybe we would not ever have thought about in the Senate? Well, um, so <laughs> it's going to be a hard question to answer because uh, it could lead to long stories. <laughs> but I, I'll, I'll say this about the Senate. I, you, know, you, you, you um, uh, In the Senate, everything's seniority based. So your parking space, literally, your uh, office, your uh, where you, where your desk is. You know, these are all everything is seniority based. So it's like you know, you come in the first day and they, you know, you go, well, which you still want your parking space? This one's come open. You could get that one. It's really funny. Um, to me, it's funny. But um, we, I sit on. I've been there ten years now, so I'm kind of in the middle of the pack, and um, I'm still sitting in the same desk that I was sitting in the first day I got there. And there's a group of us that sit together, that we've been sitting together now for 10 years. And um, one guy left us for a while, and then he, he went up front, because and then he came back, because he missed us. So, <laughs> so I say that to say, we do funny stuff. We sit back on that back row like a bunch of misbehaving boys in church. <laughs> and um, not bad misbehavior, just sort of, you know, mischievous behavior. Yeah. And we have the best time. We we crack on each other, we joke each other, we joke about other senators, and we really enjoy each other's time and company. Um, so there's a lot of funny things that happen, and we and we all have kind of a, you know, sense of humor, which we see a lot of things that are funny. So um, uh, we, we have a lot of things that happen in there that are funny, and, uh, and you know, you see them on the floor sometimes, but bunches and bunches of them, you know, come up in the back room. And I mean, Harvey Peeler's one of the funniest guys. <laughs> I mean, that, that man is hilarious. And um, I mean, he, he and so he he um, he kind of keeps like in caucus or something. He keeps us off balance. And uh, he used to, what he used to say, he was always got nervous when uh, when Wes Hayes was asked to tell a joke or I was asked to pray. So uh, <laughs> uh, that's what Peeler said. So so he you know, he was. Um, so I, you know, one story probably, but I would, I, I think it's people, it would be interesting maybe for people to know that it's not just, you know, banging the gavel and lots of arguing and fussing and fighting. And there's some of that, but mostly we get a whole lot of laughing and a whole lot of getting along with each other. And, try, and truly, the longer you stay, I think you sort of, you want to stay more for the people that are there with you, that or you're, you know, that you respect Almost like being in soldiers, you know, you're you ultimately you're not fighting because of the flag. You're fighting because you want to look out for your platoon, you know, your commitment okay. to these people that you're daily with. 
And I mean, we have this, I mean, I don't want to say the commitment diminishes to the overall objective, but I think you do have this sort of relationship that builds that um, makes you want to come back and, you know, put up with a lot of bad travel and, you know, just a lot of aggravation. It's, wor it's worth it because you sit back on the back row and laugh, you know, have That's a good right. time. It's important, I think, for people. I'm so glad you shared that. It's important for the people that are watching to remember that our senators, our House members, our governor, our superintendent of education, all the people who have offered themselves to serve on behalf of the people to represent the people. At the end of the day, y'all are people. Yeah, when we put on, we put on our pants. They're not, you know, I mean, there's not many exceptional. I mean, you know, you occasionally meet somebody who's really, really, really exceptional. But mostly in the Senate, we're, we're people that come from our communities that are you know, um, have a pretty good, uh, generally the it's, it, democracy works. You know, you're a pretty good reflection you know, of your community. Tom Corbin is a good reflection of Traveler's Rest, right. you know, which is a lot different than uh, Charleston. You know, Sandy Sin on James Island, Sandy Sin is a very, you know, she's a very accurate reflection of that electorate there. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you might not, I might not agree with my friend Tom or Sandy on something, but that's okay. It's that's the whole point. You right. know, it should we shouldn't be lockstep. You know, we're all different. Have different uh, communities. So um, yeah, and but, but we're all just we're just people trying to do the best we can mostly. Well, we appreciate you serving uh, on behalf of your constituents and the entire state as chairman of uh, education committee. We've certainly in, enjoyed your leadership and uh, your vision and uh, your courage, uh, frankly, to to do the big things that need to be done to support children and families. So thank you for that. Well, thanks. Appreciate that. And thanks for joining us. Yeah, fun, I really yeah. appreciate it. It was yeah, a great it was conversation. It, it, well, it's it fun talking. Appreciate to you guys. that. And hope you guys uh, that are listening enjoyed uh, our time with Senator Henry, Chairman of the Senate Education Committee. The one thing I'm gonna really take away from this is um, one: the Senate are people too. They're not just locked away in a room and come out to bang a gavel. But Senator Henry sees the same things that we see in education: the the rural education, the demand on teachers, the um, all of those components. So we're not working in a vacuum. Our leaders see the things we are, but what we need to do is look for ways to work together. We can't just be problem identifiers. We've talked about this. We have to be problem solvers. And we can only do that when we stop looking at differences, find our commonalities, and start helping leaders like Senator Hembry. So thanks again for joining us. We hope that you have a great rest of your week. Take care of yourselves and take care of those that you lead. Be sure to follow the Institute on all of our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Erskine Charters, we'll have all of these resources, including this podcast, many stories of our schools, and other things. So check us out. The opinions expressed within the content are solely the authors and do not reflect the opinions and beliefs of the Charter Institute at Erskine or its affiliates.